welcome, ladies and gentlemen, to another session here at Room for Discussion. Today we will discuss, our discussion will be about a very old and yet, as our guest likes to emphasize, eternal idea, liberalism. At some point in the 18th century, this idea that humans are endowed with the capacity to be agents of their own destiny in terms of economics and politics took form in something that we now know as liberalism. It is here, as our guest and as other uh, scholars like to emphasize, where we can find the answer to why uh, humanity has enriched itself, itself uh, these past 200 years. However, so essentially, uh, let people be who they are, and they and the rest of the society will benefit. However, this idea has not been free, free of its critics nor uh, challenges. Today, we'll address some of its more contemporary challenges, starting off with China. Has the rise of China provided a viable alternative to our liberal democratic systems? <laughs> uh, we'll move on to inequality. Have the forces of liberalism created irreconcilable differences between different members of society? And are these differences a threat to our democracy? And lastly, we'll address more challenges to our own humanity, such as climate change and AI, artificial intelligence. How should a liberal confront these issues? We're joined today with, uh, by Deidre McCloseley, the renowned economic historian of early British industrialization and a well-known staunch defender of the liberal slash libertarian ideas. Uh, if she just published a new book on liberalism and why it works, if you're interested uh, to read more, you can uh, find it at the Safer Store today. Uh, we will be answering, uh, asking our own questions, but you, the audience, also have the opportunity to ask yourself some questions. So when the time comes, make sure to raise your hand, and Nina over here will come uh, with a microphone so we can all hear your very important points. Uh, for now, let's just give a round of applause and a, uh, and a warm welcome to Deirdre McCloskey. I'm an outer, <laughs> so I'm kind of slow. Okay, good so. I don't think so. It's good. Here, I'll sit here. Uh, let's just start. Ah. I was trying to shake your hand, but. Well, I, uh, that's okay. <laughs> we'll <laughs> consider it done. Okay, good to know. So, welcome on my behalf as well. The first thing we kind of want to understand for the base audience as well is that in countless interviews, you kind of mentioned that you're a libertarian. Sometimes you use the term classical liberal, other times you use liberal. What we yeah. want to know is which view do you actually prescribe to exactly, and what does that actually entail for political and economic systems? Well, all three, they m mean the same thing. And of course, in, in, in Holland, it, it liberal means what it once meant, which is the theory that we do best spiritually and materially if, we're, if, if none of us are slaves. That's the key conviction of liberalism. Not wives, slaves to husbands, not slaves slaves to masters, and not citizens, invoners, slaves to um, the police or bureaucrats. So they all mean the same thing. I, I want to claim back the word liberal, because in my own country, it's come to mean something like its opposite. It's come to mean social d democracy. Um, increasingly large state supervision of all of us. And th that's been so for about 100 years in the United States. In Latin America, it's even worse. Do you think there, it's there the word liberal means uh, fascism, essentially. Do, do you think liberalism is in crisis today? Yeah, it's been under assault from, from, uh, for, from populists of the right and of the left. Which movement do you think is more dangerous? Well, what's actually more dangerous is the long-term assault on liberalism from my friends, the social democrats, and my friends, the moderate conservatives. 
I have friends in both, in all these camps. Uh, I, I say to my uh, right-wing friends, I say, Marx was the greatest social scientist of the 19th century without compare. He was the hero of my youth, and they get angry at me. Then I say to my friends on the left, I say, and he got everything wrong, and they get angry at me, which is why I have no friends. <laughs> <laughs> but why would you say that they, like, these two, not... You not extreme. Not extremists. Why are well, they because, the, the most because damaging Because that's the underlying conviction of everyone in this audience. I, I, I take it there are few, if any, here who are of the extreme right, the, uh, the neo-fascist uh, right, which is you know, very powerful in, from, from, from the Philippines to the United States. And I imagine there are few of you, maybe some, but few of you who are of the extreme left that I was once. My first formation was anarchism. When I was, when I was 15, I discovered Prince Kropotkin's book, Mutual Aid, in the local library, you know, wonderful irony, a library that had been funded by Andrew Carnegie. <laughs> <laughs> I just love this fact. So I went, then I became a kind of folk singing Joan Baez socialist. <laughs> I know more labor songs than anyone here. <laughs> Los cuatro generales. <laughs> um, And uh, then I gradually, I studied economics, I became a Keynesian because that's what Harvard College offered and then I became an economic engineer and then I gradually became a Chicago School economist. And now I say that my view is humanomics. Ario Klammer in Holland is a great advocate of this. Mm -hmm. um, economics with the humans left in. And what, what, what exactly, what, what does that actually entail? Well, it entails knowing philosophy, history, literature, theology, uh, sociology, anthropology. It involves looking, humanities. At, looking at humanity okay. instead of looking at, well, the, this, uh, what would you call it, this, um, uh, this sociopath who is the economic man, so-called, homo economicus, yeah. economic human. Uh, and uh, now we have a, have such a person in the White House, a sociopath. <laughs> All right. And it hasn't worked out very well. Interestingly, when, when my, my partner here, Elmer, asked you what was the, the, the biggest enemies of liberalism, you mentioned, you didn't mention China. The World Bank has described China as uh, the country that has experienced the fastest sustained growth uh, ever in history. Uh, and it is, of course... That's not quite true, but that's okay. Let's but that's, go uh, that's, that's what the report says. No, that's but not right. uh, China uh, is not politically liberal, but it has, of course, experienced reform since uh, 1970. Yeah. Uh, 19, actually, 1978. Not 1970, yeah, this is the 1970s. Why is China not, not a viable alternative? It's, it's a terrible alternative. It's, 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 it's crushing the human spirit. In George Orwell's 1984, uh, O'Brien, the party man, says to, says to uh, uh, Wilson, if you want a vision of the future, think of a human face with a boot stamping on it forever. And that's what she wants. He wants a boot stamping on a human face forever. So I, I abhor um, China, although I've, I've been there a fair amount. And, and I try to be polite. I don't shout at the but it's people at the border that they're fascists, but they are. And, and the key th here's the key point. The so-called Chinese model is a silly, silly idea. It's kind of a, uh, it's, it's okay, I can't say anything more. Heck, I guess is, is the better word. Because what's worked in China are the liberal parts, namely the parts where you allow, you're allowed to go work where you want to, although they have regulations on that. You're allowed to start a factory or start a hair salon when you want. And the Chinese hadn't forgotten how to do um, entrepreneurship. 
even though they were under communism for all these years. But, and as a result, that's where they get their growth. In the state enterprises, they throw away money. In the private sector, they get it. Well, I do have a question on this, because we do agree that some of the massive part of economics growth is, of course, liberal policies. But we studied Cheng Gang, who said that the CCP incentivizes successful local leaders to improve their economic situation and drastically punishes those who do not. The incentives are political. Would you say that these incentives for provincial leaders try and incentivize them to produce the most economic growth? That's not how it works. Here's how it works. Once, under Mao, it yep. worked with, in a centralized way. And uh, Beijing was telling people what to do. Then in 1978, they read Milton Friedman. I'm not making this up. They actually did, yeah. the, the leaders of the Communist Party. And, they, and what they did is they gave power to the so-called Xi'an counties, is, is a rough translation. And the counties, these little counties, not, they're, they're actually quite big, they compete for factories or for, I don't know, insurance companies. They say, look, we'll, we'll, we'll give you a special treatment. And you, we'll be very nice to you if you come to our Xi'an. And that's the core of the Chinese success. Not, it, of course, there's competition in the market for, I don't know, ice cream. But there's also this, the, this political competition. And the central government has nothing to do with it. The central government permitted it. So they stopped doing this stupid central planning and started to say, well, OK, let's see how this works. And they tried it out. For example, in um, Shenzhen, I always mispronounce it, this enormous city opposite Hong Kong <laughs> was once a fishing village. Yeah. And then they said, well, OK, let's try this out. We'll, we, the central government, will allow you to do anything you want. Go ahead, feel free. And they did. And now it's 20 million people. I've been there. Modern buildings, people doing very well. They're not as rich as the Dutch yet. And it'll be another generation before they're as rich as the Dutch. But they're on their way. But the more important example is India. Because partly because it was so, so depressed by the beginnings of success in China, but also for internal reasons. In 1991, liberalism in the economy took hold. Now, it's not, you know, it's not Hong Kong. It's not a, not a kind of ideal liberal economy. There's still a lot of regulation. There's still tariffs between Indian states. Now, this is, this is crazy, but they, they still have them. But it's a great improvement over what the Indians called the license raj where to do anything, you needed permission from someone. And of course, <laughs> the man who had the permission had his hand out for a bribe. Yeah. Now, they, they've started to grow, grow extremely fast. Now they're growing faster than China is. Yeah. Uh, and they're a democracy, crazy, kind of loony democracy. And the Hindus are, rulers are getting obnoxious about the, about the Muslims. But at least they're a democracy. At le still, however, in, let's say, the Chinese eyes, the Chinese uh, uh, government, and to some extent its own people, India is still not necessarily, India is still not the model that they should follow. For, for them, my concern here is... That's right. My concern here is that we in the West can point to the fact that we became rich, we enriched ourselves through the liberal ideas. Yeah, here in Holland. It started right here. Right here. However, in the China case, because you, you mentioned how devastating it is, how uh, like the, the, the state is a tyrant, yet there is another side of the argument, which is also that China is one of the best stories in the history of the world. No, the amount it's not of people. one of the best stories. No, in I mean, in, in terms of people leaving poverty That's at a massive baloney. scale. Baloney. The, the best story in the history of the world is Northwestern Europe, okay, yeah. starting in Holland and go, moving to England, Scotland, and then France and Belgium and so on and so forth. So in that's, recent times, the best That's history. the original story. And okay. it makes my story that I've done in a, in a, in a trilogy of books on this matter, um, uh, the, the bourgeois era, it's called. Um, it, it makes it, the, the, the Indian and, and the Chinese case make it easier to make this argument. But there are many examples of countries that have started unspeakably poor, 
Sweden, for example, in the middle of the 19th century, was the poorest country in Europe except for Russia. Wow. And then, it start, it, then in the middle of the 19th century, Sweden started to liberalize free trade and so on and so forth. And that's when it grew. It grew remarkably fast up to the 1930s. Japan is the same story. Yeah. Hong Kong after the war was as poor as the mainland. Uh, it had a, 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 a terrible standard of living, one dollar a day. Now it's income per head, of course <laughs> we'll see, but it's income per head is slightly below that of the United States. So specifically be because of course we here can point to those liberal ideas making us rich. They do. Especially here. In, uh, ex and they we also can do make us virtuous. But are you concerned about the millions of Chinese that are coming out of poverty, that are creating a, a Chinese or a, even a developing world middle class that don't necessarily, that they became rich with a government that was quite big. But they, and that but, to some but, extent they still think it's a quite vital part of their You're, you're insisting on, on putting the two together, the politics and the economy. And the Chinese are intent on keeping them apart. Yeah. So then the deal of the Communist Party is in 1978, they started behaving rationally. Before that, they were completely nuts, backyard blast furnaces and the Cultural Revolution and so on. And they started to act sensibly, at least, in 1978, and allowed people to make, make money, make profits, and it worked. But it works everywhere. It worked in Amsterdam in the 19th century, or in, in, the, in, the, in the Golden Age, too. It works in, uh, in, in England in the 19th century, in the 18th century. It works everywhere it's tried. Everywhere you let you decide how to run your life and help poor people. I'm not a sort of vicious to hell with the poor. I'm not Donald Trump, express it that way. I, I'm, I'm in favor of, of helping poor people appropriately, and I'm willing to be taxed for that purpose. But I'm not willing to be taxed for, say, American foreign policy, which is crazy. We have eight, the United States has 800 bases abroad, military bases. So I'm, I'm not, so the, the, the modern state is grotesquely big. The Chinese state is much smaller than, than you think it is. Yeah, well, well, on the question of this, because I do think we need to steer a bit more to the normative question about liberalism, which is just your view between this tension of economic freedom and political freedom. Where exactly would a liberal stand between that two relationships? Well, we, freedom is freedom is freedom. Liberty is liberty. Is, is, you can speak Anglo-Saxon or you can speak French in this matter. There, look, you, you're not less a slave because you're only a slave on even days of the month. <laughs> Right? Th then you're a slave, and even days. You're a slave if you can't love whom you want. You're a slave if you can't change gender, as I did in 1995, right here in Amsterdam. Not in Amsterdam, in uh, Rotterdam. You can, you're, you're a slave if when you want to go into an occupation, the government stops you which is shockingly common in my country. In 1950, 5% of the occupations required a, 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 a license from the state. Now it's 30%. In the United States, at least in Florida, to become, now hear this, an interior decorator, you arrange the couch and paint the wall, you have to go to school, and get a pass an exam and a certificate, I guess, to make sure you're not colorblind. This is crazy. And, and it, 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 it's, that's the core. Let people alone. No slaves. Yeah, we're going to talk a little bit more in detail about what can constitute slavery into a certain form. But first, we're going to talk to the audience and ask them if they have any questions. Any questions for... Surely you right all there. agree with me so far. That gray sweater right there in the back. Wait, wait, there's a, there's a microphone because yeah. this is being recorded. Uh, Would you stand up? Yeah, S stand up and ask a question, don't... 
Okay, so um, I wondered about your claim that liberalism works in Northwest Europe and that's the greatest success story in the history yeah. of the world and how that relates to colonial exploitation. Yeah. Because I, have, I, have a, I see a tension there. I have a whole bunch of chapters on that. I'll be glad to talk to you about it now and afterwards and endlessly. The claim is, the, the claim from, from the left especially, or indeed from the right, because some of them think that Colonialism was great. We Dutch stole from the Indonesians. Wasn't that wonderful? Um, so on both the left and the right, there is a belief that e Europe became rich because of overseas um, exploitation. And that's really, really implausible if you look at the numbers. Even in the late 19th century, when the Dutch were essentially supporting their central government, not only the central government, with taxes, essentially, is what amounted to on the Indonesians. The, sh the share of national income that the central government was spending was very small. Now it's much higher. Don't think of it in, in recent terms. Think of it in 1880 or 18 1890. So even, <laughs> even that, now, Dutch colonialism is not the worst. Um, uh, uh, probably the worst is Belgian. Uh, with uh, Leopold the, 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 the second. It's a good example for, for the case, to answer your question, because the, um, the empire in, in, uh, in Africa, granted by the Treaty of Berlin to Belgium, <laughs> was to the Belgian king. Ordinary Belgians did not receive a centime from the sale of rubber from the Congo. It went to the king who built c castles in the south of France. It was very nice for him, but for no one else. So yes, a few people grew rich on empire, but a few people grew rich on lots of things. Most of what happened was technological change, organizational change, again, starting in Holland in the Golden Age, that, that um, made for a vastly more, more productive economy. Let's do one more question. I saw yeah. let's yeah. have a Let's yeah. have a female voice. A female voice. Yeah, sorry. Yeah. <laughs> I'm sorry, you don't. She does. She gets to do it. Hi. So um, how do you reconcile the fact that freedom can also create immense inequality when it comes to opportunities? No, it doesn't. It's false. <laughs> Could you please elaborate on that? Well, we are, we're, we're going we're, we're to elaborate on we're, that. We're going to talk right about now. that in a minute. But briefly, if the inequality comes from stealing, like imperialism, some imperialism, not, not British, but some, if it comes from stealing, or it comes from government monopolies, I'm against it. And it should stop. And you and I can march against it. But if it comes from the, who's that famous goalie for the Dutch who said these stupid things that were kind of profound? What is we his have name? No idea. Surely the older people know who I'm talking about. The goalie. There was, he was a goalie for the, for the Dutch national team. And he was like, he, he, said, he said stupid things that are actually quite profound. Anyway, but what? Yeah, that's it. Yeah, oh, that he's not a goalie. yeah, that's right. And, and he, yeah, a soccer player. And he made a lot of money. In fact, in modern times, he'd make even more. I mean, millions of euros. What's wrong with that? I don't have any problem with that. We pay to go see him make a save or say something stupid. And what's the problem? A singer, Frank Sinatra, made a lot of money, too. Well, uh, duh. But why, why are we so excited about that? But if it comes in these bad ways, this, this use of violence, then I'm with you. We're going to have some more room for elaboration soon. We do have to go with our questions right now. I'm going to run down three statements. He's going to mention one statement, and we just want a yes or no answer. Okay. But then we'll go for elaboration later. First statement. High inequality has a negative impact on the functioning of Western democracies. Uh, no. 
Okay. The, the belief in it does, but not its actuality. High inequality is damaging for democracy. Well, that's what you said. It's a, it's a more elaborate, because we just said Western democracies, but... It's, it's only damaging if you think it is. Okay. okay. Uh, the state should play a bigger role in order to mitigate climate change. No, they should pl play a smaller role. Okay. The impact of artificial intelligence on society and the economy will require intervention by the state. Why do you think the state would be good at fixing anything? We'll talk no. about that <laughs> <laughs> later. Have you actually encountered the state? I mean, right. actually, here, the state is reasonable. I've, I've lived in, 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 uh, in, in Holland yeah. for, for three years, and I admire your society. I tried to learn your language, but I was 73 years old, and I couldn't do it. But I love Holland. Ik hou van Holland, maar, maar, ja maar, as you say, ja maar. Um, most states in the world are vicious and incompetent. And uh, yeah, you can come up with your own examples of that. All right, uh, moving on to the first two statements, they were both no on inequality. Yeah. So first of all, there seems to be, just from the reports we read from the World Inequality Report, Bigity, but also from the IMF, also from the World Bank, that inequality, or at least the trends, pre-tax inequality has been increasing. It's false. It's uh, completely false. Pre-tax. Pre-tax or post-tax, okay. I don't care. It has not Okay. So the rise of inequality, one of the main factors, no, let me just finish the question. Yeah. One of the main factors is, uh, according to these theories, is the share of national income going, uh, going to labor. To no, to, to, to the well, uh, to, sorry, the share of, of wealth becoming more important as national income. This is big this idea. And because the richer percentage of the population own most of the wealth, then that's shifting uh, the, the wealth. Why? So if you don't agree, why is this uh, not, not, not the case? It's completely wrong. Everything about it is wrong. All right. If you want to see an unequal society, look at France in 1700. Then the share of the rich people was half of national income and a larger share of the, of, the, of the physical wealth of the nation. That's inequality. The modern inequality, as I said, partly it has largely to do with what economists call marginal product. That is this uh, 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 uh makes a lot of money because he's, he's a good soccer player. The, that's where most of it comes from. And, the, the, and its change is small. Now, I want you to get that in your head. In my own country, the share going to labor, which would be a, another measure of inequality, fell. Oh my God, the share of labor is falling. This is a sign of inequality. Do you know how far it fell? From say the 1970s to the to to, to 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 about 10 years ago, it fell. Now hear this. Hear the number. From 63 percent to 58 percent. Five percentage points of national income was all that it fell, and now it's reversing. Now the share going to labor is starting to go up. Since when? Since the last uh, in. Since the, well, certainly since 2008, it's starting to go up. But, but you know, I'm not saying it's, but here, here's my main point. As an economist, I want to persuade, as an economic historian and economist, I want, I want you to understand that it's a little change. It's not a big change. Inequality is characteristic of human societies. Um, I, I have a friend named Sam Bowles, who's, who's a very good economist. And Sam gave a paper I heard where he said, Sam is a man of the left, once more on the left than, than now. But Sam said, oh, you know, I've studied all kinds of societies, hunter um, agricultural, hunter gather all over, and they all have the same income distribution. And then at the end he said, we've got to do something about inequality. I said, Sam, you've just shown that inequality is a human condition. I don't love it but I don't hate it either. The main thing that's happened in the last two centuries 
as you can see by just looking around you at your colleagues here, is an increase in income per head for the poorest among us. My ancestors were Irish. The poorest, they were the poorest, except for these Swedes. And, and the increase in income per head since 1800, hear this now, is 3,000%. 3,000% over the base per head, per person, in real terms. No monetary tricks. Now, which is more important? This, this engine, this liberal engine that creates wealth for people and makes it possible for people to go to university and to have satisfactory lives and to travel to Indonesia and pay back the Indonesians. <laughs> uh, <laughs> Um, or uh, a society in which equality is achieved at the cost of poverty, so like North Korea. So we, we of course, since the, since the 1800, uh, 1800s, we have seen uh, incomes increase impressively uh, throughout the world. Impressively, I mean, amazingly. But talking about more just contemporary history, because this is something that often... It's continued. It's, it's often what we oh, and, hear and that since the 1980s, this, there is this, this, this is what we talk about, this is from the IMF report, from the World yeah, Bank, yeah, from Piketty, yeah, yeah. that we see actually inequality increasing nonsense, three nonsense. times. Wrong, inequality. wrong, wrong, okay. wrong. Here's why. If you look at the income distribution of the world, and why wouldn't cosmopolitan Amsterdamers look at the whole world? Why would you say, oh no, I only want to look yeah, at yeah, Holland, yeah. oh. In the world, inequality in the last 40 years, 30 or 40 years, has fallen like a stone. Okay, but what about specifically in the United States? Oh, but why in specifically yeah. in the United States? Do you only care about Americans? I'm quite surprised. <laughs> I, I don't. I care about the whole world. And the whole world is getting better. And it's continuing. Income per head, in real terms, has been increasing in the world since... Well, you can pick your dates, but it, 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 let, let's say after the war, ever since the war, has been increasing 2% per year in real terms. Now, that doesn't sound like Ms. McCloskey, if you take the only unit of analysis being Western European countries, what would be the case for inequality then? Well, it, there's not a case for inequality. I'm not celebrating inequality. But I'm saying that if it's achieved honestly, without stealing from people or forcing them by bringing the fist of the government to bear, as is rather common even here, then I, I have, you know, I'm not envious mm -hmm. of Lilian Betancourt, who is uh, Thomas, uh, Thomas Piketty's black beast. He hates her. She's a jerk, I admit. She's a fool, a cow, a calf. Uh, uh, she, she's not a sensible person. She's the richest woman in the world, maybe except the, the Queen of England. And um, she's, she has yachts and, and bottles of $5,000 champagne and ridiculous things. So that's terrible and stupid. But I'm not envious of her. All right. And no one in this room should be envious of her. Why, why would envy be a good basis for social policy. As, has, uh, as Shakespeare said in, 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 in one of his sonnets, he, he, he envied this man's figure and this man's wealth. And, this, un, and then he says, because these are, these are love poems, he says, until I thought of you, my, 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 but, my beloved. But would you say envy over discouragement? Because they're two different things. What's that again? Discouragement. So people actually feeling discouraged to work by the levels of inequality. I wouldn't say that's as much envy. No, they're not discouraged to work. Why is that? Well, why would inequality make them discouraged to work? Why would the income of the Bacon Corps you know, and her wealth, well, why would that discourage the, the, me from Because working? there are actually some studies, for example, a recent paper written by Branko Milanovic and Roy van der Reine that shows that Inequality is associated with a lower increase in incomes of the poor and higher incomes increase of the poor. So the, as, as inequality increases, the richer are getting richer and the poor are, are, are getting richer, but to a lesser extent. But don't, don't you think that this creates some sort of 
diminishes social cohesion in the country. That, that has reversed in the last five years. It actually has. Go, go, go examine okay. it. But, but it hasn't completely reversed. It's starting to reverse. Yeah. That, 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 that particular event. And income is mismeasured, chronically so. And all the serious students of this matter agree on this point. The problem is that the quality of goods and services has increased. Think of tires. The older people here, if they had automobiles in the 60s, they knew that tires were very unreliable. I mean, I, I've, as a guy, I changed an awful lot of tires. And now tires last for 40,000 miles or more. And this is characteristic of modern goods and services. And it's very hard for the official numbers to take allowance for that. So it's not true, for example, as people are always saying that wages are stagnant in, in the Western world. They're not. Wa real wages, that is the real ability to get, I don't know, pleasure, has increased. The, the most spectacular example of this is what everyone in this room has in her pocket, namely a smartphone. Uh, talk about artificial intelligence. The uh, smartphones, you know, the comparable thing is, is I don't know, <laughs> the, the telephone at the corner, and you're pushing Hulda into it. I mean, this is really, yet you, you can't do the calculation very well. So it's massively understated. But I'm, still, I'm still not completely following because at the same time before you were mentioning that we're not these sociopathic human uh, economics individuals. And the question is that, of course, you can say maybe absolute wages have been increasing, they have, but they, in the past five years it's reversed. But if you look at, for instance, populist elections in the United States, right. I would say that's completely motivated by certain emotional drives. That's right. That less. That's exactly right. There, I, I completely agree with you. Worldwide, not just under uh, uh, individual one, but in, but in general, uh, um, uh, uh, populist envy and resentment is the thing that has been aroused. But it's been aroused. It doesn't have a basis in fact. Or to put it more gently and not more accurately, I'd have to say, it has some basis in fact, but nothing like to the extent that the resentment has caused in politics. People voted for Donald Trump out of resentment. Sometimes they voted just for the hell of it, and this really irritates me, but out of a resentment encouraged by, well, Donald Trump. And this has happened in Hungary. I was there two weeks before the last election. The air was thick with anti-Semitism and anti-Islam um, uh, uh, propaganda. The Muslims are coming, ha! Ah! The Muslims are coming to Hungary. They want to learn Hungarian? Are you nuts? Hungarian is very hard for an adult to learn. They were on their way to Germany. Let them go. <laughs> it's so, it's not just silly, it's vicious. It's what happened in Yugoslavia after the fall of, uh, of Tito. Once Muslims and Christians and, and Serbs and everyone else got along reasonably well, they married each other. And then the politicians came and said, ah, here's my opportunity. I can speak for Serbian nationalism and kill Muslims as the, as the Dutch bat shamefully but allowed to happen. Coming back to inequality, yeah. uh, because you say that uh, the envy itself and this uh, narrative is the one fueling it, but there is some evidence, in particular looking at America, uh, by Page and Gillens showing that a public policy that is preferred by the wealthier percentage of the population are often passed in Parliament, in, in, in Congress, whereas public policy that is preferred by the lower percentage of the income are, are sometimes not considered or when are very likely to pass. This is 2014. When has that not been so, dear? When has that not when been the case? When have the rich not been powerful? I don't, I can't imagine. I, I, have you ever heard but of it? The question is, has inequality made it worse? No, it didn't make it worse. It just, the rich have power. I admit that. 
in the Roman Republic. The rich had more voting rights than poor people. Sometimes the poor people had no voting rights. Certainly the slaves and the women had no voting okay, rights. But I understand you're doing it historically, but if we compare, for instance, the Netherlands versus the United States, you can agree that the high wealth owners in the United States have considerably more power on the political cycle than they do in the Netherlands. Are you sure? I'm pretty confident about that, yeah. Why? Because you can just look at the amount of lobbying votes. For instance, I'm not denying that there is wealthy power in the Netherlands as well. Again. We've never been denying that inequality might also, in some cases, be a good thing. But if you look at the United States when it comes to lobbying and the amount of wealth that's actually poured in political candidacy, yeah. whether it be oh, fossil fuel companies. The, the, the sheer amount, that's right. The sheer amounts that's spent on candidacy. But look, I, I, I would argue that we're, we who don't like that, and I agree with you, I don't like it, grossly exaggerate how much the rich are able to cash in in politics. Now, I, I agree they shouldn't. Um, the, the, the advantage that the Dutch have is that your society, although it allows wealth and, and, um, and enterprise, Dutch people are ashamed of showing it. Um, what's this called? The Pese Hofstraat, yeah, in Amsterdam. That's your luxury street. I bought clothes there. Come on, Pese Hofstraat looks pathetic by comparison with, you know, Rodeo. Avenue yeah, yeah. in Los Angeles, where people are showing off their wealth. So you have that advantage that e egalitarian social policies have, have sort of grasp in, 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 in Nederland that's harder to get in the United States. But there are parts of the United States that look like Holland in their politics, in their attitude towards the poor, you know, understand, Th think of the United States as being like the whole of Europe. And there's tremendous variation, at least a good yeah. deal of variation in Europe, about attitudes towards inequality, attitudes towards um, business, and so on and so forth. So I'm, I, you can't take well-functioning social democracies, and the Dutch are pretty good, and the Danes are really good, and uh, New Zealand, which is not really a social democracy, looks very good, and say, okay, now we can do that in the United States. Uh, it wouldn't work. We, we're basically a corrupt country in lots of ways and always have been. I come from Chicago, so I don't need to say more. Something that we, we just mentioned, political power, but something that we forgot to mention is a quality of opportunity, right? In, in, Persistent, as, as some research has shown, persistent levels of inequality can create yeah. not of a level playing field. So let's say, there. may I finish your question? Just uh, let's say uh, uh, the rich get richer, conditions they get richer, mm -hmm. and they are they might be willing to uh, opt out from public services, uh, sure. public education, For because instance. they can guarantee that they can provide their kids with better education outside of the public system. Yeah, and this already creates not a level playing field anymore yeah. because the poor didn't have to go to often less funded well schools very bad uh, schools uh, they, they are unable to get extra tutoring that the rich do do get i know i agree how can you. how can we resolve that well, lack here, of equality opportunity without diminishing inequality here's one thing you could do in this country stop making higher education free state provided higher education such as you two are the be beneficiaries of, is a scandalous redistribution from the poor to the rich. Because as you just said, the sons and daughters of lawyers and business people and professors get extra tutoring, they go to French camp and blah, 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 and they take vacations in Italy. These people are culturally expected to go to university, as the working class is not, and they are given tremendous be benefits, and then tuition is free. So 
There, <laughs> thank you. So there's this enormous uh, 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 um, subsidy. We liberals want to get rid of that kind of thing. But then they create their own universities where they get the best professors, the no, best no, classes, no, no, the no, best no, tutors. No, 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 come on. You're, the, I, I come from a country with 4,000 colleges and universities, private, Catholic, um, denominational in other ways, uh, um, uh, public. I've taught at, uh, at the University of Iowa, go Hawks, and, and the University of Illinois at Chicago. I taught for 12 years at, at the University of Chicago, which is private. And I was graduated from Harvard, which is private. I've taught at Stanford, which is private. I've taught across the range. And in the United States, rich people pay a lot for college. And that's how it, how, how, how it should be. Now, I don't want to focus on this one point, but it yeah. is an example of, and, and then the occupational uh, uh, obstructions to free um, practice. We don't have such structures in, in economics or in journalism. Anyone who wants to can become an economist or a journalist. Anyone here, I, I urge you, have a sign outside your door saying, economic advice, um, f five euros a minute. Go ahead. I can't stop you and I wouldn't want to. Whereas if you say the same thing about being a doctor or a lawyer or, or, a, or, a, or a hairdresser or, a, uh, um, or, or an interior de decorator, you'll have, the, you'll have the police at your door the next day. Yeah, I still have a question about this as well because when we're looking at certain data, it does say that the economic mobility is higher, for instance, in the Netherlands than it is in the United States. I agree. That, that's, by, a, that's a serious yeah, problem. Yeah, but by no means is the United States more free than the Netherlands when it comes to public education. Would you agree with that? Free? Well, I'm not sure what you mean by free. Well, free public education. Free in the sense that there's no uh, uh, tuition. Yeah, yeah. That's France, when, when it's proposed to introduce tuition in French universities, the students, the sons and daughters of these lawyers and, and business people, riot. They, just like yep. the owners of the, of the, uh, the French farmers, who are enormously subsidized by the ordinary consumers of the EU, they riot. But uh, I understand that part, but could we just have a very concrete answer on why, for instance, in the Netherlands you have higher economic mobility than in the United States? Because I think some of what we were pointing out is a little sure bit you the economic, education, you mean economic mobility. So the, the correlation yeah. between the, your father's your income and the child's income is lower. Yeah, so why, what's the difference then? Because we thought it was education, but I'm assuming you have a different... Well, no, I, I'm, I'm sort of doubtful that it's education, but, but it, um, you have to be careful with this because I, I, I'm, I'm not an expert on these mobility statistics, but what I do know is and it alarms me, is the geographic mobility in the United States is falling. And geographic mobility, which is not much of an issue in Holland, because you can, you know, commute up the hill to uh, yeah. Groningen if you want to. Um, uh, in, in, in the United States, it's a big issue, because you have these old industries that declined and then people stay. In Detroit. I and I don't, I'm puzzled why e Americans are not as mobile geographically as they once were. Because that, that, that solved that a lot could of be problems. A solution. Yeah, yeah. That solved a lot of problems. In the 1950s when I grew up, people moved to California. I, I grew up in Boston. They moved to California all the time. And their incomes went up uh, as a result. If they'd stayed in the declining industries of Massachusetts, um, uh, um, textiles and shoes, making shoes. Those, the, when I was a child, that was declining. Now Boston is a big boom town, but then it wasn't. And they left. And that's the solution, is to leave. That makes for more mobility by class. So I want to, the, the last question on inequality. So researching, of course, we did try to find out the general view of economists about inequality. And we found a survey by the IGM Forum. This is a Chicago survey. Yeah. And they were asked, this set of economists, prominent economists, especially from America, they were asked uh, if the rise of inequality is straining the health of liberal democracy. 
and 33% of the economists surveyed strongly agreed, 47% agreed, while only 2% said they disagree. So why do you think you, exactly, why do you think you and the 2% have been unable to get all the economists on board well, on this I, issue? Well, uh, you know, it, it, the, this, by the way, is not my special field. Yeah. I'm not a, uh, I don't know, inequality maven. I have c colleagues in economics more broadly who are, but I'm not. So, I, you know, I, I may end up saying things that are wrong. I don't think so, but, you know, I, I try to say the truth. But I, it doesn't really bother me a lot that 47% agree with this uh, statement um, because people, even economists, believe a lot of things that aren't so. Uh, an American humorist in the 19th century, Josh B B Billings, said, it ain't, <laughs> it isn't, it ain't what you don't know that hurts you, but what you know that ain't so, that's not true. And there's a lot of, a lot, lot of wisdom in that. And to, and to think that the big modern problem is not tyranny, but inequality, um, produced by an essentially liberal society, which Holland is, is, is dangerous and wrong. Let's move to a little bit of a less contentious topic, climate change. Uh, well, don't be so sure. <laughs> <laughs> the, the first question I have, because you already said no, but some liberals would disagree that this isn't necessarily infringing on the view, but do you think the government should internalize the cost of greenhouse gases? Yeah. Oh, you do? Sure. We were not expecting you to say that. Well, that's because you're, you're not, you haven't read all of my books. <laughs> yeah, we tried. But but this is, this, come on, this is, I've written a lot of books. And you got to read them. You, what you do is you pile them beside your bed and read 10 pages a night, and then you'll become wise. Uh, <laughs> look, um, the, what most economists you'll find agree on, and, and I've just said that that doesn't, that doesn't necessarily mean it's right, yeah, it but I think it is, that the way to handle this is to have a carbon tax. And I've been in favor of that for 30 years. Do you think we're too late? Because no. the argument for Nordhaus is that we'd implement it over a longer time and He's increase right. incrementally. He's but we right. haven't, I mean, the United States hasn't been really great at doing that, nor the Well, that's because, of the, uh, that's because of individual one. By the way, you know why I call him individual one? Because in the, the indictment and then conviction of his lawyer, who was sent to jail because of things that Donald Trump ordered, in the indictment, instead of naming Donald Trump, they called him individual one. <laughs> and so now on, I'm going to call him individual, individual one, one. Yeah, yeah. and I look forward to seeing him in an orange jumpsuit <laughs> with shackles on his head. Uh, Why well, anyway, are you going to nice. Well, you know, because it's, he's right. He's one of the greatest dangers of, of tyranny that we have in the world. If he gets reelected, God help us all. This could be extremely dangerous. For the for for for, for liberal societies, we could we could talk about Trump for another hour, but sadly we don't have a anyway, that much time me. on the on the climate yeah. change thing. Because, for instance, if you go 30 years back, I would definitely agree on the carbon tax. That's right. The thing is, some people have said that it's too little time. And the question I have is, one, should the pricing of carbon be raised at this point, just because sure, we have should. less amount of time? Should be very high. Very high. Carbon should be high. Now look, one result of that, and this will. You, there are a lot of you who will disagree, but ask yourself, are you really basing your disagreement on the facts or on just some fear? The French have solved it. Atomic power. That's what you should be doing. That's what we, you should be doing and we should be doing. Atomic power. It's the cleanest power available at a reasonable price. And the French have uh, have solved it, they get 90% of their power from atomic power. The Germans, who, you know, hate carbon, and I can understand why, I do too, also hate atomic power, yeah. so they want to make it wind power. I mean, God, God. The, I think there's substantial um, promise in, in solar power, but you may have noticed that it's raining outside. And it's not altogether clear that Holland's problems with power can be solved with 
such things. I mean, there's clearly, we need a stable form of power source that runs We need a source, we, 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 you, what you need is a backup for the yes. times, for the numerous times when the sun doesn't because shine. Because we don't have good enough batteries either, but I do have a question on this because... We have because, to improve batteries, but yeah. if we improve batteries, that yeah. solves a lot of problems. Yeah, but uh, the question also on this part is because I would agree with you on nuclear power, but a lot of people in the United States support this kind of subsidy for nuclear power, but that would go... I don't want a subsidy for it. I want it to compete on its own. Okay, so... If it, if it doesn't... That's the market test. If it doesn't compete, to hell with it. You're not going to make but Holland or the United States better off by subsidizing things that don't earn their keep. That's just common sense. It would be true in your own lives, in your own personal but lives. Would it be it common sense to leave these, let's say, more human challenges to our humanity? I mean, it, it really depends. Our future depends on us, you know, turning the clock on, on climate change. Would it, make, would, would it be common sense to leave that to market forces? Yeah. yeah. Because they're much more powerful yeah. than these very indirect forces of politics. The problem with politics, I mean, I'm, in, I'm, a, I, I'm a Democrat, small d, and I think that it's terribly important that people vote and that everyone be allowed to vote. Uh, the worst thing that the Republicans have done in the United States is to try to suppress voting. I mean, I just find that hideous. But okay, but... <laughs> Our great journalist, H.L. Mencken, said, democracy is the theory that ordinary people know what they want and deserve to get it good and hard. And that's the trouble. You can't depend on democracy to make good decisions, but you can't depend on the experts either. They got us into Vietnam and the, and the second Iraq war, so I don't know if that's so great. Uh, I kind of lost yeah. track of your questions. No, 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 it's okay. So it's okay. Uh, no. Now we have some time for more extra questions from the audience. I think someone here. Now yeah. allow a uh, man of my generation. <laughs> <laughs> we're gonna have, we're gonna stratify this. We're gonna have people by age and gender and sexual orientation. Perhaps it is not entirely in this discussion, but I would like to you to comment on the role of and I cannot pronounce it well. Ayn Rand. Ayn Rand. Yeah, the, the, the writer from yeah, Russia. I know, I know who she yeah, is. I know philosopher. Who Ayn Rand is. Well, you know, I came to my liberalism the other way. I, when I was a kid, I, as I told you, I was a socialist, anarchist, Keynesian, social engineer, blah, 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 blah. All kinds of other things, state or state sponsored. Most of my friends in liberalism or libertarianism, uh, came by it by reading Ayn Rand's novels when they were 18. And I tried to read Ayn Rand's novels when I was 50 years old. Can't do it. They're terrible novels. Like you could get to page 18, and that's about as far as I could get. Um, strange, because in Hollywood, you're, you're right, she came from the early years of the, uh, of the Soviet Union, but in, in Hollywood, she was a she was a scriptwriter. She was a script doctor, I think, more than anything else, F fixing scripts. So it's kind of surprising their fiction is so lousy, but it is, and it's very attractive to an eight-year-old, especially boys, uh, because it says, "Oh, you're free to be selfish. It's good to be selfish. Go ahead, screw the poor. Yay!" And I don't approve of that. Yeah. Right now, I'm, I, I, I'm a convert to Anglicanism. I'm an Episcopalian. And I call myself a Christian liberal, which means that I acknowledge an obligation to the poor. Uh, one of the ways of fulfilling, fulfilling that obligation is to let the poor work, as I work and you work. That, come on, let them have jobs. Um, anyway, uh, no, I don't think much of Ayn Rand. I don't hate her. And she, in fact, her books continue to sell, and a lot of people have been brought to a liberal point of view through this. But the trouble is they have this kind of mean-spirited edge to them, which I don't like. 
Okay, let's talk about putting the poor to work. I'm going to try and shove automation in a five-minute time period because we're going to go a little bit over time. But clearly, when we go to the economic concept, we understand that capital is very valued and that the human value is not infinite. Otherwise, it wouldn't take any risks. But it's clear that there's a rapid automation taking place. People's jobs are being lost to the use of machine learning and automation. The question we have in the long term, what does it mean when the human value is no longer necessary, when it's no longer an element of the market? Well, th this isn't... The Number one, this isn't ever going to happen. The economy is owned by you and me. Yeah. So let's get that out of the way. The machines are not going to take over, number one. Number two, machines have always taken over. The bow and arrow is artificial intelligence. The bow and arrow. It calculates where the little spear should be thrown. Um, you, it's automatic. You aim and go. You go. So before you had to have a spear and you had to have the skill to let go of it at the right time or else it would go in the air, go on the ground. Now you just aim and pull. Um, we've been doing artificial intelligence as humans since the beginning. So there's, as far as technological unemployment is concerned, it doesn't happen. Now I know you don't believe that. You think, oh my God, no. Well, here's an example. In my country, in, 19, in, in 2000, the year 2000, there were 130,000 people employed in, wait for it, video stores. Where are all those people? Are they standing on street corners? No. Farming is the most important example. In Holland, even in Holland, even highly, you know, Holland was urbanized from the, from, 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 from the 15th century on, uh, the most urbanized part of Europe. Yet still, agriculture was quite important in, 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 uh, in the Dutch Republic and even in the kingdom. Um, and those jobs have disappeared forever. Here's an amazing fact which more people should know. Even more economists should know, and a lot of them don't. I didn't know it until about three years ago. Every year, in an economy like yours or mine, 15% of the jobs, the slots, vanish forever. And if you think about it, that's kind of obvious. You know, a, 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 a little firm employing people goes bankrupt. It gets some new technology comes up, like uh, like happened to, to video stores or farming. The long term example in the United States in 1800, 80 percent of the population was on farms. Now it's one percent. Those jobs have vanished forever, for t technological reasons, for all kinds of reasons, and yet there's not 99 percent unemployment. So there's something desperately wrong with the idea of technological unemployment. Okay, so I, no I think sense. you do need to distinguish between a little bit of just technology and then artificial intelligence on its own, exactly. because I agree with that a bow and arrow in its form is aiding our intelligence, but I would say one of the key tenets and goals of, for instance, a free market system is that you do have a competence hierarchy that gets established, but when you're dealing with AI, <laughs> you're dealing with competence that exceeds all human capacity. If you look at I mean, a car was originally aided by human beings, but you're dealing with a car now that can be completely done by artificial intelligence. Yeah, the question okay. is, what does that mean for government intervention? Because maybe we could agree that you can replace it, but should government intervention take a role in, for instance, smoothing out the damage that automation causes? Absolutely cars? not. Absolutely not. Look, what makes you think that people in Den Haag know what they're doing? Where did you get that idea? Has that always worked out well? If you, now, in Den Haag, they're not as stupid as they are in Washington. And in Washington, they're not as stupid as they are in, I don't know, um, uh, name your, in Moscow. It's very unlikely that arts graduates who are bureaucrats in Washington will get artificial intelligence right. It's much more likely that people whose livelihood depends on it will get it right. So I, I just find it amazing that people think that there's this perfect government over there somewhere 
over in the we're in, not, in, we're in not saying Stopera. That. Have you been to um, Stopera? Is that a perfect uh, uh, government? That's where the uh, that, that's where you go if you're a foreigner. So, because you are mentioning, for instance, you keep saying these things about stupid bureaucrats or people in the hack are stupid, but I think that adds a key emphasis on the problem that humans can be very stupid. They and can. the fact that you can automate it and take a step higher than what is currently the normal human yeah, but mind. Let's but let's specifically look at a case study, for instance, with truck driving and automation. Yeah, yeah. For instance, what is the role in government with that? Because if you do introduce automation, it's relatively easier. I mean, of course, it takes a lot of planning for AI to take over the position of a human being behind the wheel. Fine. But so, because you're dealing with millions of jobs, so you're saying that there shouldn't be government intervention, for instance. Look at, look at, look at, look at, take the case of agriculture. But can we focus on truck driving? Just well, as okay, to focus on truck driving, but it's the same case. These things have disappeared. They've gone away. Once, for, let's take an example, uh, take another example. Once we had, enor Amsterdam had enormous amounts of servants. Yep. Rich people had servants, my country too. They're gone. There aren't any maids to speak of. Uh, um, the vacuum cleaners, yeah. okay. The same is true with the truck drivers. Sure, it's millions of people. And by the way, the, your, your country is unusually competent at truck driving. Uh, and a very large amount, a very, a very surprising share of y European over-the-road transport is owned by uh, Dutch companies, and that's been true since the 16th century. You've always been very good at, um, uh, as uh, well as Makala, as uh, as, uh, as Koopman, <coughs> as uh, buyers and sellers, dealers. Okay, um, it goes away, it goes away, so but what? But what about Hand when, they weaving went away when the effects do not necessarily go away? One example could be so AI will essentially be a labor demand shock, like yeah. the China shock was. So what? And we saw, well, that's very consequential. In America, in America, we saw these people that are from a specific type of job, unionized, low skilled, and also high wages, not doing anything and well, but some people have even pointed that that especially the china shock was tied to the rise of uh, now, look, the great look, devil now w w hold it the china shock is myth china wasn't the problem the problem is innovation inside the united states itself 80 90 percent of the jobs lost in the rust belt were lost to other parts of the united states so the overseas trade that Trump frightens us with, oh, the Chinese, the Chinese are coming, slant-eyed bastards, let's get them, let's get them. We were afraid of the Japanese in the 1980s. And now we're afraid of the Chinese. Hmm. Suppose this was Dutch investment. Would anyone be afraid? Of course not. But it's can all, we, it, it, you don't think there's any racism? But what, what, can we go to the six million jobs that were lost between 1999 and 2000? So what? Well, I mean, I like what, no. What do you do with them? Because, because they are the unemployed. They are, need to get ready to be educated. The jobs are not. People then get new jobs. That's my point. Fifteen percent every year disappear. If we undertook to, I don't know, subsidize those people in place, then we'd have steel mills operating in Holland, which would be stupid. We'd have shipbuilding going on in Holland, which would be stupid. We'd have agriculture going on in Holland, which would be stupid. So that's one thing we could do. Or we could retrain. retrain. But that's again to assume that Den Haag and Washington know, know how to retrain but, people. But wait, so Whereas the individuals are the people who know best. And if we start saying, well, I'm going to subsidize every year 15% of the population Wait a second. Pretty soon, we're su in three years, we're subsidizing almost 50% on our way to 95%. You can't be Argentina. You can't think that everyone can live yeah, on yeah. everyone else. But let's talk about a different policy prescription than just subsidies. I'm going to talk about truck driving because I do like truck driving. But if yeah. there's 3.5 million truck drivers that are nationwide that have the chance to be out of a job, would, would you, you say, say that a gov in, in the United the States, United States, States yeah. if a government intervention, for instance, would require a truck driver to be behind the wheel just as a safety precaution, even though in reality the car, the truck doesn't need it, would you be against that kind of policy? Of course, we'd be against it. We we we've been through this on the railways. 
the firemen became obsolete, well, they became really obsolete when railways were, uh, here in, in Holland, were electrified. <laughs> but they were obsolete as soon as diesel engines in the United States became the common method. Um, and the diesel fuel, oil, didn't require someone with a shovel to put coal into a furnace. And that, those are called firemen. Mm -hmm. And for decades, um, you had an engineer and a fireman in the cab of the, of the, uh, of the, of the locomotive. This was ridiculous. Everyone agreed it was, but, but the unions insisted on it. And it was stupid, and it was a waste, and dumb, dumb, dumb. My grandfather was a freight conductor on the railways. Now, the freight conductor was the boss of the train. And in the old days, there was something called a caboose. I don't know what it is in Dutch. Maybe it's, it's actually kind of sounds like a Dutch word. It was on the end of the train. And that's where the crews hung out. And a 100-car train would have nine employees on it, maybe even more, 10 sometimes. And my grandfather was the boss of that. Now they need two. They need one engineer and one brake man to handle the, um, the so-called grade crossings. We have a lot of those in the United States. And they could probably get along on one. That's progress. It's a good thing, not a bad thing. Sadly, the interview is about to end, so we just have time for one more question. So, because we are in ec the economics faculty and because you've, we've talked about economics and about how economists can be wrong at times, I want to know, uh, because since the financial crisis, of course, there has been much discussion about what economists should learn and what they should have uh, already known before it. So, I in your opinion, have economists has economics as a field learned anything since the financial crisis? No. Um, and, and, and the reason is that most of economics is essentially correct. Saying that there's no such thing as a free lunch, and saying that you should be prudent in the economy and not do stupid things, and saying that occasionally we'll overbuild, get too enthusiastic, and have a recession. Since 1800 in the United States and in Holland too, there have been 40 recessions. They happen about every five years. And that's not because of some conspiracy of the bosses or something. It's because we get over-enthusiastic. So waves of populism, I'm populism, um, uh, what is it, uh, pessim pessimism. Uh, optimism and pessimism. Okay. <laughs> But, it's, but here's how it is. I'll go behind the blackboard. It goes like this. Up, up, up. A factor of 30. 3,000%. That's what we need to focus on. We need the rest of the world to become rich like we are. That's, that's for human fulfillment, for people not dying when they're 30 years old, dying in childbirth. We need to do that, mm -hmm. and it's not we who needs to do it, we need to let them do it. Because it turns out that if you let poor people alone, they become rich in the modern world. Well, thank you very much. Uh, before we give uh, our guest a round of applause, I do want to mention a couple of things. Uh, first, uh, Room for Discussion will continue having interviews. We have uh, an interview coming up with uh, Accenture Rebellion, uh, so make sure to be there. And the other one, is it already? And we also have in a, the, the elected president of the European Council coming to room for discussion, Charles Michel, the 20th of November. So make sure you go to the two of them. Uh, lastly, uh, our guest, uh, uh, Professor McCloseley, uh, just published a book, as I mentioned, and you can find it there if you found this. If you want to explore her ideas on liberalism and libertarianism, make sure to check it out. It's a compilation of uh, essays, correct? Yeah, well, in the lar a hundred page essay in the beginning. Okay, and, and a larger hundred page essay from in the beginning. Uh, so make sure to, to check it out. And uh, yeah, please give her a, run, a warm round of applause. Thank you.